Hey everybody and welcome back to another edition of the Physio Tutors podcast. Today we have with us Anthony Cioli. Uh, Anthony is a researcher and a physio uh, who uh, looks at, uh, well, uh, we're topic we're discussing today osteoarthritis and also other areas of research as well but Anthony that's just a quick 30 second why don't you give us a one or two minute intro into you a little bit about you and then we'll dive on into the questions definitely thank you for having me on Um, so again my name is uh, Anthony Tioli I'm essentially a a PhD student at the moment at McGill University in rehab science uh, and I'm doing research on NeoA and uh, total knee replacements um, I'm also a physiotherapist clinician. I work in private practice, uh, primarily seeing uh, patients with musculoskeletal conditions, uh, as well as patients with neosteoarthritis. Um, and I also teach live courses on neosteoarthritis and provide online courses and webinars on the topic as well. Okay, great. Um, so for anyone listening, I hope uh, if someone's listening to this, they have an idea of what uh, OA is, but maybe if you can give us a brief uh, overview of what it is that's going on for anyone who might not be so familiar, someone who doesn't touch this uh, topic very much. For sure. Yeah. So osteoarthritis is essentially um, the most common form of arthritis. So arthritis is more of an umbrella term and osteoarthritis is a type of arthritis. Um, and it's essentially a disorder that affects any movable joint, the knees, the hips, um, the hands as well. Uh, and the most common is usually the knee that's affected and essentially stems from an imbalance between um, cartilage breakdown and cartilage synthesis. So what's believed to kind of happen uh, is that you have, let's say you have a joint injury. It causes damage to the extracellular matrix. Then you have the innate immune system, which is essentially our first line of defense. Um, the innate immune system is responsible for identifying um, foreign bodies or particles or pathogens within the body and removing them. So the innate immune system will see those um, extracellular um, matrix, the, the, the fragments that, that came from after the injury, and they'll try and remove them. But what ends up happening is it brings in this inflammatory response that will upregulate um, catabolic factors, so those that break the cartilage down, and it will downregulate the the anabolic factors, the ones that build it back up. So you end up with this imbalance, and then eventually it starts to lead to um, different kinds of changes within the joint. Uh, and I think one misconception often is that it's just the cartilage that's affected, but it's actually the entire joint over time that begins to get affected. You have um, <clears throat> you do have a thinning of the cartilage for sure. Um, there's a thickening of the subchondral bone, which is the bone that's beneath the cartilage itself. Um, formation of osteophytes, you have inflammation of the synovium, uh, and there's also degeneration of the ligaments and the menisci as well, which can sometimes lead to joint laxity and a thickening of the joint capsule too. So definitely uh, the whole joint is affected when it comes to OA. Okay. Uh, So what sort of structural changes can we potentially expect then you know you mentioned there that it's not just the cartilage that's affected it's also the the bone itself uh there's also the meniscus there's the soft tissue in and around that Mm -hmm. yeah so those those are essentially um with in terms of imaging those are technically all the things that you would end up seeing um the way it manifests externally essentially is the common signs and symptoms we see of oa um but it's essentially just to sum it up in terms of the changes, I mean, you have changes at the ligament level, the menisci level, uh, subchondral bone, so bone beneath the cartilage, the cartilage itself. Um, there's also inflammation that's kind of more widespread within the joint um, and the synovium and the thickening of the joint capsule is probably the primary changes you would see if you were taking an, an image of someone. Um, if you're kind of from the outside looking and you're, and you're looking at a kind of OA joint, it kind of depends where it is on the spectrum, but you might see some bony enlargement at the knee. Um, you might see some kind of de- sort of deformity, if you will, but a varus or valgus deformity. Usually it's more of a varus deformity that you'll see. Um, but those are kind of the externally what you would normally see of an OA knee. And then the other changes were more like if you were to take an image uh, okay. using, uh, let's say, MRI, for example. Okay. And uh, you touched briefly there on uh, sort of how it would look from the outside clinically. So for you and I as clinicians, what are the things that we should be looking out for? Yeah. Um, I think one of the most helpful things I find um, is kind of drawing from the clinical classification criteria that are already available. So there are three of them. Um, there's the, U, um, not the ULAR, the ULAR is a uh, treatment. <laughs> oh no, there is the ULAR. There you go. Sorry. Uh, ULAR, NICE and ACR. And essentially it's three different guidelines. Um, and the, the idea with the whole, um, with clinical diagnosis is that you don't need an x-ray to clinically diagnose OA. Um, You can do it based on their age, their symptoms, and their clinical findings. 
So based on these three classification criteria, the key symptoms you're looking for really um, are usage related pain or activity related pain. You're looking for either no morning stiffness or uh, stiffness that's not, no longer than 30 minutes. Um, and self-reported functional limitations, which you would probably see also during your objective exam. So in terms of symptoms, those would be the key ones to be looking for. Okay. Uh, is there any, uh, what, what are the clinical uh, findings that you're looking at then? So yeah. from testing? For, in terms of testing, so uh, it kind of depends on the clinical classification criteria you're looking at. Um, for patients consulting in primary care, which is the majority of cases with NEOA, the NICE guidelines appear to be the best. And they don't have a ton of clinical, uh, main clinical findings. But if we take a look at the other ones, some of them, which in my opinion are, some of them are useful, others are a little less um, useful in my opinion. So for example, restricted joint movement, which we would expect. If you see any bony enlargement, uh, tenderness of the bony margins of the joints, you can get sensitivity there. Um, no palpable warmth, so you don't want the joint to be hot. And the last one, which I think is a little more on the controversial side, uh, is joint crepitus, so any cracking at the knee joint with active movement. So it is included in some of the clinical classification criteria. I'm not entirely convinced um, that that's something that we really need to be concerned about with regards to, like, um, you know, if it's there, oh, you know, then we can kind of rule this person in as having OA or anything. I know you need, with the clinical classification criteria, there are a specific number of them that you need before you can kind of rule it in, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, but again, we're not like, in terms of healthcare professionals, it's the medical doctor making the diagnosis. It's not like physiotherapists. I personally, I find these clinical classification criteria extremely useful for to inform your clinical impression so it's really when that patient comes to you and you're the first person they're in contact with it's just to get an idea of like could it be possible i'm dealing with oa and that's where these really help guide you in the right direction um, and like i said before because the, cl the classification criteria are kind of split into symptoms and clinical findings it makes it it kind of informs your subjective and objective exam in a way because you know um, what are the most important things i need to look for and then there's the extra stuff kind of thing so um Although we can't obviously diagnose it, it has to be uh, from a medical doctor. Um, these clinical classification criteria are extremely useful to kind of help inform your clinical practice as well. Cool. Yeah, that was one of my questions as well. You mentioned there that uh, the medical doctor has to be the one to confirm the diagnosis. I know that's the way it is here in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, sort of, although we can see clinically, this is what it looks like to us. We can't give that diagnosis. So I was wondering if it's the same over there in Canada as well. Yeah, it's pretty much the same. And I think, I think the most we can say is, um, uh, according to, you know, my clinical impression, I, I believe it may be this, um, this is what I'm suspecting. Like you can never say anything definitive to the patients, even with regards to this. Um, it's really just a question of saying, this is what I believe is happening. I believe it is this. And, you know, obviously we, it's, you, you can't necessarily say, you know, you have a way it's, it's really just, um, based on my findings, this is what I think is happening. And then you kind of leave it at that. It's really just to inform your clinical impression. Okay. Um, and look, you've taken us through a little bit of your assessment side of it. You've mentioned that you're going to look at the age, the symptoms, the clinical findings. And within the yep. symptoms, you're going to be, you know, that's going to be when you're talking to your patient. So what is it that's going on? You know, uh, what's happening? What's, what's the issue for them? Yeah, the stiffness, the pain, yada, yada, mm -hmm. yada. Where do you then go once you've got your clinical findings? What for you is your next step? Mm -hmm. with the patient um i think the subjective has over time has become a larger and larger portion of my exam uh, mainly because the objective the objective findings tell me a lot but i feel like the majority of my treatment especially within that first session ends up just with patient education and a lot of it comes from so in that subjective you know you're obviously looking to rule you know, you're, you're trying to rule in uh, to rule out any you know red flags anything that that, that you would say oh you know i'm not I would have to refer out for this patient or just to be cautious about um, you're doing kind of those obvious steps uh, other than um, the, you know, your, your typical history and, and how did the pain start and how has it progressed and have you had any imaging or anything like that? Um, I'm really just trying to get a better understanding of their, their, what, how they perceive their own condition. What do they believe is happening? What do they believe the causes are? Um, because those are going to be, those are fundamental to how to, to, to the treatment process afterwards. So um, oftentimes, you know, you will speak to patients and certain patients will say, you know, I have 
I've been told I have osteoarthritis from the doctor and, uh, and then they have certain beliefs about it. So it's, it's because I was running or it's because I, I did this in the past or I played sports or I did this. So it's for them, it's they then, for example, that would lead to them stopping exercise because they heard that that will wear down the joint even further. And then, so it's just to get an idea of just a baseline assessment of what do they believe caused their OA and what do they believe is actually happening within the knee joint. Uh, and then, so those are kind of, and those are questions that you can kind of ask as you're going along. Um, with respect to anything else objective, um, I mean, gait analysis, it's really quick, just kind of walk back and forth. I'm looking for a couple of um, kind of key things. One of them is really just, do we have a more or less normal range at heel strike, um, you know, when we're transferring the weight? Because a lot of times we start to lose that knee extension with knee osteoarthritis. The knee stiffens up, their knee is held in a bit of uh, inflection. Um, and so what ends up happening essentially is that when the point of contact, so let's say their knee is in flexion, normally their knee was extended, they would, you know, heel strike and everything's fine. When their knee starts to flex, the idea there and what's believed to happen is that if normally you're always hitting one spot when you heel strike, if you were to bend the knee, you start to shift that load onto an area that might not be otherwise adapted to receive it. Um, so what ends up happening is that area, which is not that well adapted to receive the load, um, is unable to kind of handle it and then it can you know, potentially create other changes. Um, so the idea there is just to let's try and normalize ROM as much as possible. We don't know, you know, can we get it to perfect? Yeah, I, I don't think it's possible to know in advance. The idea is let's just try and normalize it as much as possible. That's the best we can do. Um, something else that in the literature, there isn't a ton on it, but it's essentially, it's called a varus thrust. And it's essentially a, a kind of walking pattern where the knee kind of thrusts inwards and comes, it's like kind of thrusts in and comes back to the middle, to the midline. Um, and there's been a lot of kind of research on it, taking a look at like people who have that kind of gait pattern, um, their medial knee away tends to progress a lot faster. So for, for these individuals, and it was one interesting study, I think it was by Benel, I don't know when it was published though, it must've been 2012 or 2014, but they essentially um, found that individuals who demonstrated this kind of gait pattern responded better to a kind of neuromuscular exercise program where you're focusing more on controlling the movement of the knee and being a little more conscious in the way it moves while you're performing exercises. Um, so they found that for these, these individuals, it seemed to help, it seemed to be of more benefit for them. So I think for this individual, if I see that, it's just telling me, I think we need to work a little bit more on controlling the knee and being a little bit aware of how it moves. Um, but other than that, it doesn't really tell me a whole lot more. Um, in terms of uh, other assessment, we're looking at the typical stuff, ROM, strength. Um, I think something that I like to do with strength is just to test in different positions. So um, if we find one that's less painful, we, right away, you know, you know, it kind of guides your exercise treatment, your exercise prescription afterwards. Um, ideally, when you are prescribing exercises, you do want them to be as tolerable as possible. If not, if, if they're not painful, even better. Um, but a little bit of pain obviously is, is not something that, uh, that would stop us from doing the exercise. It's, it's part of the process if it, if it is there. But by changing the, the angles that you're testing the strength and by doing it in different ways, it essentially just informs your, um, it can inform your exercise prescription afterwards. And then just kind of a, a basic functional tests, your squat, single leg squat, um, heel raise, bilateral, single, step up, step down, that kind of stuff. Um, it's really just, that's why the objective is really basic. It's just to get an overall idea of their uh, functionality and what they're having the most difficulty with and how they're moving. After that, um, you kind of, you can move on to uh, uh, the patient education and the treatment aspect. Okay. Uh, so then what is the approach when you're taking forward into your treatment aspect? What, yeah, what are the pillars that you base your treatment around? I would say the majority of my treatment would be patient education and exercise. There, there is a, a certain manual therapy component, um, um, but it's a little bit more of a kind of active approach, and I'll discuss that in, in a little bit. But essentially, patient education, I think the, the biggest things that I'm looking for is really just to um, provide the patient with, um, you know, the information, what, what is NEOA? Because a lot of them, for them, no one has even had, had the chance to explain it to them. So for them, they're kind of, it's this mystical thing that they're really, they don't understand very well. Um, so I think that's probably the first thing to address is if, if that's what you believe or suspect is happening, this is what it is. Um, um, and like I said before, you want to try and get an idea of what they believe uh, about the, their condition, because that will influence in a way how they what they choose to do in their treatment, whether or not they adhere or anything like that. 
Um, one of the big ones is educating about flare-ups because they do happen. So it's just so that they're aware, even when you prescribe, like on the first day, usually I won't go past three exercises. It's usually what I provide. Um, and for a couple of reasons, mainly because it's realistic to do, it'd probably take you 10 minutes. So in terms of people who are really busy, um, for them, they're like, oh, this is awesome. I love it. So three exercises usually on the first day. Uh, and then if they do, and I usually have them do it in clinic. So if we do experience any of those slight increase in symptoms on the spot, then that could be your opportunity to explain about the flare-ups, but they are normal. And what we do tend to see in, in a good portion of the individuals with, uh, OA is that you, when you do something new, you tend to have a bigger response initially. So a bigger, there might be a bigger exercise in this flare-up initially, but if you stick at it, that the, 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 the extent to which the pain increases after exercise starts to decrease to the point where your body accust is accustomed to it afterwards. So that's something that's really important. And that's something that I tell uh, a lot of my patients, just that look initially, it's because this is new for your body. Your body is just kind of on alert. It's not, it's like, what, what's happening? Why are we doing this exercise? And then all of a sudden, the more, you do it within your limits, obviously, you, all, you start to become accustomed to it and all of a sudden it starts to become relatively comfortable to do. And then at that point, you know it's no longer kind of challenging enough and you'll have to add in another exercise at a certain point. Okay. A um, couple things there. Uh, so yeah. where for you is the cutoff both uh, in terms of pain or flare up, both in terms of there and then while they're doing the exercises and also um let's say for the reaction afterwards so for for, for myself what i say to my patients is that for, if you have a, a day the same day maybe a little bit into the day after that's okay we can still play around with that but if that pain's kicking about for two three days still then maybe we pushed it too far do you do you have any cutoffs that you use yourself um in terms of cutoffs i if we're using kind of like a zero to ten scale i tell people to keep it within like that you know three to four three to five range um, it kind of depends on the patient. For some patients, a five is really not comfortable. And so for them, that probably wouldn't be a great example. Um, three to four is usually kind of like a good sweet spot. It's like it's tolerable, but it's not getting to like moderate kind of uncomfortable um, where to the point where they might just stop doing the exercises altogether. Um, with respect, so that's during. Afterwards, um, I just, I kind of phrase it in the way that I, I don't want a huge flare up for um, so there, we don't want a big flare up. That's one. And two, ideally we don't want it lasting all that long, all that long. Technically there's, there's no real guidelines for that. Um, I tend to tell people ideally, you know, by the next day we sh we should be kind of reestablished. You know, you might end up with a little bit of a, a spike throughout the day. Um, and then the next day we're good. Obviously the next day we don't want any increased uh, swelling of the knee joint or any kind of increased morning stiffness. Um, so if that's the case, then we would just like tailor it back a bit rather than remove the exercises and then see how they respond to that. And if we hit the sweet spot, keep it there for a bit and then slowly increase afterwards once they're accustomed. So more, more or less what you were recommending. Okay, cool. <clears throat> and then when you're uh, creating your treatment program, obviously patient education is a massive factor in order to get them to realize what's going on and what's normal and what's not. When you're doing your exercise therapy, we'll come to the manual therapy as well. When you're doing that exercise therapy, how do you build that up? Do you sort of go first off, we're going to work on strengthening or we're going to work on the muscular endurance or we're going to work on the complete chain? How, how do you then go on your build up there? That's, that's a really good question. Um, I would say my approach is a little more general than specific. I think a lot of times we look for these little nuances or things that we find in the objective and try to correct them when sometimes it may not be possible. And a lot of times, I mean, strength decreased um, or increased weakness of the quadriceps muscle is, um, is one of the most common things we find in individuals with knee OA. But sometimes we have the tendency to assume that because they don't have enough strength, they experience pain. Um, but sometimes it's, it could be deconditioning. It could be that the pain stopped them from moving, which then led them to do less. And then eventually now, you know, they, they developed the, the quadriceps muscle weakness. So there's that temporal factor. We don't know where it kind of came from. Um, I think my two big principles, one is get them moving. I, I it could be just prescribing a walking program. Um, but I, I really need to know what they enjoy. Uh, and I think that's something that's like my mentality initially was like strength, strength, strength. Like my bias is, is, and, and will always be strength training. I think that that's where we can get the most benefit for patients, yeah. uh, along with the other health benefits, um, and a, like a physical activity program, walking or anything like that. Um, but after a while you start to realize that that's not interesting to everybody. So, um, I think one of the big things is just finding where the patient is at and what they're willing to commit to is another big one too. So I, I often ask my patients like, what's your day like? 
if I were to give you a 10 minute exercise program, is that feasible? And then they'll be like, oh yeah, that's, that's, that, I, can, I can definitely do that. That's perfect. Perfect. So three exercises, 10 minutes. Um, and they told me straight up that it was realistic. I'm happy. Uh, so I would prescribe that. Um, but in terms of approach, like I said, it's really just what do they enjoy? And I'll kind of build it around them because I think that that's what's most important. If it's walking, we'll get there. Most people have a cell phone. We'll get them tracking their steps. It motivates people. It provides them objectives that they have to meet. Um, and it gives them kind of solid numbers that they can look at. Um, and uh, in terms of exercises, even if, for example, they say, you know, I really enjoy walking, I still will give them like the, um, you know, like, for example, squats, lunges, whatever the exercise is, I'll still give them like an exercise program at home. Um, and, and like I said, the first day will be three exercises. Really what I'm looking for is kind of a global lower extremity approach. So it's not just focusing on the knee. I'm not just trying to increase the strength of the quads. Um, it's, it's in the entire chain. So if, it, if I had to choose three exercises on the first day, it could be, for example, um, working on kind of lateral step ups to work a little bit more on the hips and knees. Uh, it could be uh, quarter squats if full squats are, are, are kind of too ir irritating for the knee. And uh, we could have heel raises, glute bridges. You can you kind of take your pick. But essentially, I'm looking really for um, at least one knee and one hip exercise. And then the, the third one, you can kind of decide based on what you're finding. Mm -hmm. um, but that, those are usually, that, that would, I would say that's the staple to start initially. Okay, nice. Um, and what about that manual therapy that you mentioned? Mm-hmm. So the manual therapy, I think my approach has changed a little bit. Um, I find what tends to help the most and, and what I meant by an active approach is more um, kind of getting the patient a little bit more involved with the manual therapy, if you will. Not, not necessarily, it could be kind of auto massage if they find that that helps, if you will. But um, it's more like stuff like mobilization with movements, for example, where they're able to kind of reproduce it themselves or uh, repeated movements. So for example, you know, knee flexion really hurts, but repeated extensions, they, it makes their knee feel awesome. Perfect. Do 10 of those every hour, for example. And, and then they can do that and they can kind of provide the overpressure themselves with their hands. Um, but what I really like about that approach is just that you do it in the clinic with them they're like, oh, my knee feels a little bit better already. And you're like, perfect. Now you try it. And then they all of a sudden, they're like, I can make myself feel better. And I think that's really, the, it, it kind of just removes the reliance from you. Because I think one of the, what I see most commonly, and this is just from what I see in general, uh, from, from where, where I am here, is there's a heavy reliance on manual therapy, such as massage and that kind of stuff. For like, let's say your session lasts 30 minutes. It's like 25 minutes of manual therapy and that exercise is crammed within the last five minutes and it's like, go, go, go. Let's give the person the paper and it's done. Um, but if you do it that way, the patient, like you can already tell the relative importance of what you place on the treatments, right? So the patient's going to pick up on that right away. What's more important if you just spend 25 minutes on the manual therapy and five minutes on the exercise, the patient's going to say, oh, it's the manual therapy that's helping me and that they're going to keep kind of coming back for that when we know that, yes, it can, it can help maybe reduce the pain, but the effects are kind of temporary and um, especially in a condition that's chronic, it's, it's really, you only get temporary relief. And I know a lot of people will say, oh, well, we use it for like that window of opportunity, but that window of opportunity is so small that Fleeting, that's, yeah. yeah, it really is. Uh, so, I mean, initially you can use it that way to start, but you really have to wean them off of that because long-term they, they need to have their own solutions for, for, for managing their condition ultimately because at the end of the day, the pain may fluctuate um, and it may, some days might be worse, some days might be better, but the answer will not be, at the end of the day, it won't be the manual therapy that's going to make the big difference. It's going to be their lifestyle changes, the exercise, um, kind of them taking control. That's what long-term will make the big changes. So I think um, the manual therapy approach, that's a little more active. So including kind of, including the patient in on it, like for example, with the mobilization with movements and repeated extensions or flexions, whichever they prefer. I think it's a great way to kind of marry the two with the exercise and the manual therapy. Um, but I think if there's a heavy reliance on like kind of quote unquote myofascial release and all that stuff, I think that's when um, we often kind of see fail, failed rehab because <laughs> at the end of the day, it, doesn't, it didn't really give us the result that we wanted. Yeah. They're looking for somebody else for a fix rather than seeing what can they do is quite empowering if the patient knows oh, if I do this myself I can you know give myself some relief I don't have to necessarily be there at the clinic for someone to give me a rub down for uh, yeah that's for but that's time. exactly it and I think the tendency that I have with even just the frequency of my scheduling is usually like I'll see the, the patient the first time on week one I'll see them a second time on week two one to make sure that everything's okay 
Two, to make sure the exercises are fine and where everything's progressing, answer any questions they have, proceed with the treatment, maybe give them another one or two exercises. Then again, two weeks space out, two weeks space out, maybe three weeks after that. So within 10 week or 12 week period, you have five sessions, let's say, which is fairly realistic, five sessions within three months. And if they stick to their exercises, it's a pretty solid plan. But the whole point of that is to slowly give them more and more of the rope, if you will, and let them kind of, um, and, and you're there every step of the way. You know, I provide them with my email or anything. They can ask me, they can contact me at any time and I provide them uh, with answers. Um, but that's, I think eventually that's really the goal. I mean, seeing, let's say you, you see someone twice a week for four or five, six weeks, it's just for this kind of a population, it's not necessary. Um, because what we do know about, especially with, in terms of response to exercise programs is there's different people that respond in different ways and at different speeds. And you can have people where they only respond after three or four weeks. So can you imagine after like eight sessions, they still haven't responded and then they start to those eight sessions besides costing the patient a fortune were unnecessary because really what they needed was to kind of, you know, something to help calm down the pain. And then you provide them with the tools to work on that at home. Um, yeah. So I think, I think that's really the best approach. Oh, awesome. No, I'm totally with you there. And um, so you mentioned sometimes people take a little bit longer to get a response. Sometimes people might take eight sessions or whatever, or um, four weeks, what have you. When is it an indicator for us as clinicians to recognize, hey, um, this patient's not improving or mm -hmm. the improvements that they've made are so marginal, maybe we need to take the next step. Uh, when should we as clinicians look out for maybe we should get them to an orthopedic surgeon? That's a, that's a really good question. Um, so you can have kind of different responses. You have people who respond immediately. So for those individuals, um, I think the answer is simple. If they're seeing progress, continue. You're on the right track. Then there are people where the, the, um, the response is a bit delayed. You know, you can have a very marginal improvement initially, and then they start seeing bigger improvements at week three, week four, for example. So I would definitely say keep at it for at least four to six weeks. Um, obviously, unless like whatever you're doing is, is just they're spiraling out of control and it's just getting really out of hand and progressively worse week after week. I think that's like a really specific circumstance. But otherwise, I would keep at it for at least four to six weeks. Um, and then if you're seeing progress, continue. That's what's most important. If at any point you hit a plateau, um, I, you, there's, a, like, there's a number of things you can change. And I think a lot of times people assume that a plateau is just like, oh, this is the effect we had. We won't have any more of an effect. But there's a couple of things that happen with plateaus. I think with patients who have OA, we're afraid of over like in terms of exercise overdoing it because then they end up with flare-ups so a lot of time they're underdosed so initially they go from not moving to moving so they see a benefit but then they get used to that so quick that they plateau and then if we and then the the goal at that point is to modify something so to either add in an extra exercise give it a week or two see how it responds or one or two exercises um, increase the intensity um, progress their, uh, in terms of physical activity, the number of steps walked per day, for example, or the number of uh, strength sessions per week. So you can, I would say, play around with the parameters first and kind of mix and match until you find the sweet spot. And then if, if you can kind of get them out of that plateau and they continue to progress, perfect, continue. And then again, they hit a plateau, same concept. If you re you've repeatedly kind of gone through that process and no matter what you do, you're kind of at a plateau. I mean, your first line management is patient education exercise and weight, uh, weight management if necessary. That's something you can recommend to the, uh, and, and educate the patient about. After that, you have kind of your pharmacological treatments, your manual therapy, assistive devices, uh, injections, that kind of stuff. At that point, you can kind of, um, they don't have to necessarily, the second line doesn't necessarily have to come in only if first line fails. You can kind of mix, for example, pharmacological management if the doctor uh, prescribes them something that can help manage the pain while you kind of get them more active. There, there's a way to kind of integrate the two if need be to get the patient where they need to be. Um, but so I would say stick at it for at least, at least four to six weeks, um, tweak some of the parameters. If repeatedly, you know, you're, you're trying everything you can and nothing's changing, you can start considering other options. Now, what are those other options <laughs> is probably the, the kind of the next question. And it's a difficult one to answer. Um, if we're looking at assistive devices i mean the braces they can help with pain when you're wearing them they don't uh from from my understanding they're not slowing the disease progression or anything like that um but it's really just a support to help with the knee um but long term it's not really the solution um that that that's needed 
Um, with regards to kind of injections, it, it really depends. Uh, it depends on the injection. Uh, I think the most common, you probably have our corticosteroid injections. Those are probably one of the most common for treating the OA. And those, um, those are, are, are recommended according to guidelines. The re, in recent years, though, they've um, had some interesting findings. A uh, few RCTs showing that essentially the um, uh, a saline injection is no better than um, than an actual uh, corticosteroid injection, which is kind of interesting. Uh, and then um, there was another study it was published by McAllen. I think it was in 2018 or 2019, but essentially they found that um, repeated injections over two years um, of the corticosteroid worsened. Um, it, it, it resulted in a thinning of the cartilage that was significantly more than just the saline injection. Um, so essentially what we're seeing is that one, the effects are fairly short-lived, usually four to six weeks, if there is any effect of the corticosteroid injection. Two, there, um, there appears to be a strong placebo response to intraarticular injections, which isn't unheard of. I mean, anything that's kind of invasive does have a stronger placebo response. Um, and there is uh, the possibility that repeated injections may actually kind of lead to worsening or, or, or um, a greater thinning of the cartilage. So right then and there, my first question to myself is, um, what are the benefits? Right now, it's from what we're seeing, it doesn't appear to be any better than a placebo. And the effects are only four to six weeks. Okay. What are the harms? Well, it may worsen the, uh, it, it may lead to um, greater thinning of the cartilage compared to a saline injection. Okay. What's the cost? I think that varies where you are, if it's covered by any healthcare and anything like that. And are there alternatives? That's my big one. Uh, and right then and there, you know, right away, there are a ton of alternatives. We have, you know, those lifestyle factors we want to change, weight management, exercise, um, kind of just the person gen in just generally leading a healthy lifestyle. That's the alternative. So for the corticosteroid injections, I don't, I don't really tend to recommend them. Um, most often, if the patient ends up having them, it's because they went to see, uh, let's say, an orthopedic surgeon, and that orthopedic surgeon said, I recommend it, you're having it on this day, and then they have it anyway. Um, so that's usually what ends up happening. Uh, but it's not something I openly uh, recommend or suggest, just mainly because, and I, and I explain to the patient too, like it's, you know, there's no guarantee that it'll help with your pain. And if it does, it's the response is temporary. So if, I mean, up to the, the decision at the end of the day is up to them. Some people will say it's worth the money to spend it on this and just for the chance of having some pain relief for X period of time. So the decision is ultimately up to them. But the idea is let me provide them with all the information they need to actually make an informed decision and then they can go about it afterwards. Yeah. And then what about, uh, I don't know how closely you may work with uh, surgeons uh, or perhaps in the research that you're doing. When mm -hmm. do you guys go about making the decision of, look, this has now progressed pretty far. Exercise mm -hmm. therapy, uh, patient education has only gotten the patient so far. When is it time to start discussing with the patient about potential uh, surgery, would you say? Um, well, there are certain kind of criteria that are used to to determine whether or not someone is even a candidate to begin with. And it's usually a couple of things. Um, we're usually looking for moderate to kind of severe persistent pain, um, severe functional limitations, um, usually severe OA that's with uh, on, on, a, on an x-ray. Progressive deformity of the leg if it's just continuing to progress. Um, that's four. There's a fifth one that's escaping me. But I mean, the idea really there is just that it's not one criteria that surgeons will use. It's usually a bunch that will come together. And then eventually, based on other factors, the, the patient's age, on their weight, um, is this the ideal candidate? And is this the right time to do the surgery? With regards to rehab, um, I usually kind of will look at those criteria in a way to inform myself. But I think one thing that's really important is just having a really good relationship with the orthopedic surgeon that you're referring to and just making sure that you're kind of on the same page. Um, Cause I think that really does help. Like you could, you could literally have a power team. If everyone is on the same page, it just, everyone, things progress so much more smoothly because everyone is kind of speaking to that same message. Um, so I think that's probably the first thing is if you're going to refer to an orthopedic surgeon, just make sure um, you kind of know a bit about who they are, what their kind of mentality is, because it's kind of, um, contradictory if 
you don't, you know, you're, you're, you're referring someone to someone who doesn't even believe in physical therapy for knee OA, for example, right? And, and that's not uncommon. You'll have some certain orthopedic surgeons will say, uh, you know, oh, no, you know, it doesn't work. I'm not going to refer. So what ends up happening is you're referring that person to someone who doesn't even believe in your services in the first place. And then you end up at that disconnect with the patient. So I think um, just establishing communication with an orthopedic surgeon that you have a good relationship with and who's more or less on the same wavelength is a huge win if possible. Um, but yeah, no, I would probably, probably stick to those criteria to, to help guide me. Uh, but it's also a big decision to make for, you know, if we're, when we're talking about surgery, I mean, usually I think the two most common op options, um, are usually a partial arthroscopic meniscectomy. If there, if there is a belief to be kind of the meniscus, that's, um, the belief to be a significant contributor to the patient's pain. Um, but even then, as of, I think it was as of 2017, there's actually a strong recommendation against that kind of surgery. Uh, especially in individuals with, they call it degenerative knee disease, but essentially osteoarthritis. Um, and mainly because um, meniscal kind of tears and fibrillations are extremely common when you look at that population, whether or not they have pain. In a way, you see that fairly often. So the idea there is, you know, we, we don't want to be um, treating something that may not be a problem and, and you know, going in and, and removing more of the meniscus because we know it increases the risk. Uh, for the OA to progress and even for people to the risk of people having a, a total knee replacement in their lifetime. Um, and, and part of that came also from studies showing that um, the actual procedure was no better than the diagnostic procedure. So you have an arthroscopy as the diagnostic procedure where they go in, well, they, they create the hole, they go in as if they were diagnosing something, they come out. And that was no better than actually going in and performing the arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. And the second big study was a landmark study too, was showing that um, arthroscopic partial meniscectomy and physical therapy together, so exercise and, and those kinds of interventions, uh, was no better than just physical therapy. So again, it comes down to those kind of when you're boiling it down, those harms, those benefits, do we have alternatives? You start to see it checks off all the boxes. So right now, partial arthroscopic meniscectomy is not recommended in nearly all patients. So there's obviously exceptions, but in the majority of patients, it's not recommended who have knee away. With regards to total knee replacement, that's what the criteria I mentioned before. Um, but I think one thing I just that's important for total knee replacements is you have about 20% that are not happy with their total knee replacement afterwards. And I think that's important for patients to be aware of. And normally when I speak to them, they had no idea um, that, you know, the, that, you know, 20% of people report persistent pain even afterwards. Um, so it's just important to have that conversation so that they're aware of, look, there, there's no procedure that's going to guarantee, you know, 100% effectiveness or anything like that. There are risks and there are, uh, there is a chance that, you know, we may have the same pain we had after surgery. There's no one that can promise you that it'll go away. Um, but, you know, there are, there is 80% that are satisfied. It's just to, so the patient is aware that this is not some magical cure that, you know, you replace the knee and all of a sudden they're back to 100%. Um, so yeah, that's just important to mention to the patient. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm bringing it back down uh, to we're working with our patient, things are going well. When do you start having the conversation with the patient of closing things off? Because that, that, let's not kid ourselves. It's neo A. We're not going to cure it. What we're looking to do as physios is we're looking to reduce the patient's perceived pain level so that they can get back on to their daily life, daily activities and whatnot. Uh, but we're, you know, we're not magically going to restore the joint to how it was when a patient was yeah, pain free or 20, 30 years younger, whatever. So when do you start talking to talking the patient down? That's a, that's a great question. I mean, I think, um, I think one thing I would say is maybe not having the expectation of no pain for discharge, <clears throat> because I think as a whole, like you said, it's kind of this condition that's, it's, it's chronic. Once it's there, it's there. Um, but the pain tends to fluctuate. So it's possible that, you know, even when you discharge them three weeks later, they start to experience a little bit more pain, but then it goes away. And so you do have those waves. And I think once they have all the tools to self-manage, um, once they feel like, uh, once they have a solid exercise program behind them, you know, that, you know, will last them for a good while, they can always come back in three months and, you know, reassess and all that stuff. Um, but once their pain is fairly well managed, and or gone, if that's, that, that's also a possibility. If they have all the tools that they need and they have a solid plan. Um, and I'm not just talking like, okay, when you leave, you know, for this week, like it's ideally, you know, we're discharging as of now. Um, this, for the first two weeks, this is what you're doing. This, for this period, this is what you're doing. Um, and then just kind of giving them something to follow. Uh, I think that's really helpful because sometimes 
when we're seeing them, they feel like because they're being followed, it's really, it's much easier for them because they're being guided through it. But then when you let them go, sometimes it's just kind of like, uh, they're frozen on the spot because like, Oh, uh, now I'm not sure how to progress or what to do. And so I think as long as they have all the tools, their pain is well managed and they have a plan. I think that at that point you can confidently, um, uh, kind of, you can discharge the patient at that point, but you, I always emphasize afterwards, like open door policy. If you have any questions, whatever it is, by all means, contact me, uh, email call and I'll reply to you. And same thing with just, if it's just like, Oh, you know, this exercise was bothering me for whatever reason, not a problem. Contact me. We'll kind of take one out, add one in, you'll test it out. Let me know how it goes. But it, as long as that communication kind of stays there and, and they know that whenever um, they need you, that you're there for them. I think at that point they'll feel more than uh, confident enough to kind of go off and um, uh, continue the journey, continue on their own. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, one thing that I never realized, at least during uh, my education, uh, something that I found out when I was uh, on placement uh, the first time around is that actually weather can be a big factor in a patient's pain. Do you tackle that question with your patients when you're discussing the OA as well? Because it, it sounds really weird. And I thought my patient was winding me up when they mentioned this to me, but it, it yeah. comes up, it comes up quite a bit. It really does. Um, I think there's two, two big components. There's one um, is, is, and this is kind of, it could be said for anyone, the effect of weather on mood. Um, so at the same time, I, I just think that on sunny days, people tend to be happier and, and we know, you know, when we're happier, when we're less stressed, you know, you're, you tend to have less pain, you know, if it's kind of a bleak day and everything just seems kind of dim and it's just not as a happy day, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if it had an effect on, on, on their pain. So I think there's the, the mood there that plays an aspect. Uh, another interesting, and again, I don't, I don't know if this is, has been, has been proven, but like when I thought about that question, and when I think about it now, one thing that came to mind was certain patients, there's a subset of patients with knee OA who have, who demonstrate central sensitization. So it's essentially an amplification of the pain that they're experiencing. Um, it's actually technically, the, the actual definition is an increased responsiveness of nociceptive neurons in the central nervous system to the normal or subthreshold for an input. That's from the International Association on the Study of Pain. Um, and in these individuals, they don't only get amplifications of pain. You end up with pain that can spread. So some patients with knee OA, just, it doesn't just stop at the knee. It can go further down the leg into the calf. You can have pain coming upwards. You can have pain on other parts of the body as well, so more widespread. But you can also get increased responses to different stimuli, such as cold, hot, um, mechanical pressure so sometimes patients will say oh these pants are too tight as if like it's pushing down on the knee when they're not really it's just their knee has become more sensitive to light touch um, so in these individuals who demonstrate this kind of cold hyperalgesia or an increased pain response let's say to, to an increased response to cold um, in, in Canada it gets cold in the winter in Quebec it gets very cold in the winter and I can I can confidently say <laughs> that people are in more people with knee are in more pain the majority of the patients that come see me it's drastic when I see them in the winter compared to the summer. They're two different people. It's the, the pain is just completely different. So I think besides the overall mood, and I just think in, in, you know, let's say in the winter months, people just aren't at their happiest. It's cold. It's very bleak. There's not much sun. Um, I think part of that is this, this kind of central sensitization. If it causes this cold hyperalgesia that we, when we get, when I say cold, we're talking like minus 20, we can even get minus 30. So and these individuals, they might experience an amplification of pain in response to that cold, and all of a sudden they're experiencing more pain in their knee. So that's kind of the other thing that I, I thought of. Again, none of this has been like intensely studied, but I do think there is some sort of effect. What it is exactly, my best guess is probably mood and these kind of sensory changes that happen over time in patients with knee away. Okay, grand. Um, and then sort of other you've taken us through your uh, assessment side of things the treatment side of things are there any particular success stories you can share with us uh from treatment oh. <laughs> i've had a <laughs> i think <sighs> success stories it's uh there there's i think you you learn a lot from the successes you learn a lot from the, the failures as well i think from that was one the next particular one. Yeah. Um, one particular success story. Um, I think one was, I just remember her because she was on the waiting list for a total knee replacement. Um, and she, and I think the, the reason why this kind of just struck me, um, initially, and I, I think it's why in part why I remember the case so much she had, if I'm not mistaken, um, moderate knee OA 
in let's say the left knee, I don't remember the side. And on the right knee, we, um, she had severe knee away, but on the left knee with moderate knee away, that's where she had her pain and her stiffness. On the right knee, she had, zero, she had no symptoms whatsoever. She uh, has a consult from an orthopedic surgeon and the orthopedic surgeon does an x-ray of both and says, we need to operate the right. And the right is, she has no symptoms. It's just all they found was severe knee away, but no symptoms, has never had any complaint about the right leg. And she was concerned immediately. She said, I don't understand why we have to touch the knee. That's okay. My, it's my left knee that's problematic. And, he said, and then the doctor said, oh, what we'll do then is we'll replace the left and eventually you'll need one for the right anyway, so we'll just replace the right. So you put her on the waiting list for the left. And when she came to tell me this, I was like, my mouth had dropped to the floor. I was, I was, I was really shocked. It was it's just, it, I, it's frustrating, I guess. It was the mind. Yeah, to, to hear about that. It's really like, I'm just there and I'm like, no, like you have really experienced that. Like this is real. Uh-huh. Um, and it's just incredibly unfortunate. So when she told me that, so she went on the waiting list and but she was very eager to kind of become more active. She had already lost, I think, 15 pounds by that point. She was 100% invested into the process. She um, diligently did her exercises. Uh, we stayed in contact. I might have seen her maybe three, four times. Six weeks later, maybe I reached out to her. She said, I've never felt better in, you know, in so many years, I even removed myself from the, the knee replacement list. So wow. she's, yeah. So she kind of took her, she volunteered, she herself took herself off. She said, my knee pain is, you know, it, it comes and goes, but it's, it's super manageable. And the exercise that has helped. I've, I've, I think she had lost maybe closer to 25, 30 at that point. Um, and she was feeling fantastic. And it's one of the, the cases that I, I remember the most just mainly because it kind of started with that frustrating interaction and that encounter. And then, interestingly enough that led her to be super motivated to kind of take herself off the list off the list so that was just it was really a pleasure uh working with that specific patient she was uh it was one of the ones i remember the most okay uh, that's um kind of brings me on to something that i also wanted to ask you about uh not just diet and uh, in terms of uh, losing weight for a patient obviously weight is a big factor um yeah. in these cases but do you ever notice uh, with patients if they start adjusting their diet in terms of inflammation and stuff as well? Do you find that that's something that you advise and something that helps? For c- certain people might be hypersensitive to certain foods, causes more inflammation, etc. Hmm. It's a really good question. I think it's it's uh, it's not my area of expertise, so I don't really give nutritional advice. Um, I, I do tell people though that lifestyle factors such as diet and exercise are incredibly important and maintaining a healthy lifestyle is probably one of the best things you can possibly do for NEOA and anything else, um, mm. any other medical conditions for sure. Um, so I don't really give specific recommendations, nor do I feel comfortable even mentioning it, like in terms of, you know, you should be eating this and not this. If anything, I would refer out. Yeah. Um, but it would not surprise me by any means if like, you know, for example, someone who was just kind of eating terribly just started to change their diet if all of a sudden they'd start to feel better um and and they'd start to experience less pain it would not even surprise me in the least uh, i to be honest that would be my bias that if they were to change to a healthier um eating habits that it would actually have a positive influence on their pain again um, i haven't really looked at the literature on it but that would be my bias that it would uh, i mean other than the million of other benefits that you'd get from it from eating well. just seems like a win-win <laughs> yeah absolutely uh, and then I, I know uh, we're getting a bit pressed for time are there any particular learning moments that you've had from particular cases that you can yeah. share with the audience definitely um i think uh there i think there's been a because i often get um there's trying to think of one in particular i think one that really emphasized the importance of kind of um taking into account the entire person and their entire experience in that moment. I had one uh, patient who I distinctly remember, and I think this guy kind of really drilled the message home to me. Um, she was someone who was very stressed. Um, there was also, um, you know, financial difficulties as well. The job that she had, she really did not like. Um, and she ended up retiring from that job. And the person she was afterwards, um, was very different, experiencing a lot less pain, was feeling a lot better about herself. And I think it was just one of those moments where I'm like, the, there were so many other circumstances that, had, that were playing such an important role. You know, she might not have been sleeping well. She might not have been exercising as much as she wanted to. She must have been incredibly stressed. Um, it, you know, not, not enjoying your job and having to go in every day and just kind of living through that. Um, it can be pretty tough experience. And the minute she just had more time for herself, she was way happier. She was able to do the things she enjoyed. And all of a sudden, you know, 
starts to experience uh, a significant amount of pain um, without any other treatment. Um, like I, I, I essentially just, when I had first seen her, you know, we provided her with the, I, I kind of educated her about the condition, tried to get her um, with respect to exercise, but she had very limited time because the job was very demanding. And then afterwards, when she started retiring, she started to be able to do all the things that I, I kind of recommended. And that's probably part of the reason, one part of the reason, but I think a bigger part of it is just, she was in a better place. And I think for, for her, that made a huge difference with respect to the pain she was experiencing day to day. And I just think that for me, that kind of just took the message home that like the, there's so many other factors that play a role in the experience of pain that are not related to the knee itself. Um, and I think those, we can't discount them because they play a significant role. So I think that's probably one of the bigger, one of the, the, the most significant learning experiences that I had. And it, from then on, it's just been stuff that you pick up on. People are not sleeping. People are, are, are you can tell they're, they're, they're a lot more stressed. Um, so it's just kind of educating patients about the fact that there are multiple factors that can influence the pain experience. And it's important to address them all and not just the knee. Yeah. Oh, awesome. Yeah. Taking, taking everything into account as sure. the holistic yeah. part, including yeah, their job. And sometimes I suppose that could be a difficult conversation for someone, uh, but sure. yeah, ah, nice. And then are there any sort of reading recommendations, research papers that you have for, for the listeners, if they want to dive in a bit deeper on the subject? Yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I would recommend any of the, if you're, if people are interested in the best practice guidelines for treatment, um, you have the ORC, so A-R-S-I, um, that was published in 2019. You have the ACR, which, so American College of Rheumatology, published in 2019 as well, I believe. You have the ULAR, European League Against Rheumatism, published in 2013, and the NICE guidelines published in 2014. So those are, in terms of treatment, you can look at any one of those and you'll have a ton of kind of information from there. If you want to learn more about OA itself and kind of just read up on it, there's some really interesting papers I, I, I wish I had written. It was not me who wrote them. <laughs> um, but so there's one called Osteoarthritis Seminar, um, published in 2019 by Hunter and Dierma Zystra uh, in The Lancet. Um, and Modern Day Environmental Factors in the Pathogenesis of Osteoarthritis by Berenbaum and colleagues, published in 2018 uh, in The Nature Reviews of Rheumatology. So I would say start with those two. And again, if anyone has... Like if anyone really enjoyed those and wants more suggestions, I have, I have a, I have a bunch. <laughs> awesome. And then how can people uh, find you then your social media, your website that uh, you mentioned that you do webinars, seminars and stuff as well. How can people get hold of yourself? Sure. So uh, on social media, on Facebook. Um, so I run the info physiotherapy Facebook page. So we, I essentially just post summaries regularly on different articles that have been published recently. So people can kind of go on and, and read about the latest research that's being published and not just in the OA on any topic. Uh, so that's on Facebook, Info Physiotherapy, same thing on Instagram, on LinkedIn. Um, you can just add me, you can connect with me, Anthony Tioli. And on Twitter, uh, my Twitter handle is Info Physio PT. With regards to the website, we do, I do have um, three kind of online lectures and courses up at the moment. Um, you can feel free to look through those and if you have any questions. So my website is um, www.infophysiotherapy.com. And if anyone has any questions about any content that I posted or even anything I spoke about here or any of the online courses, they can feel free to reach out to me um, via social media or even by email. Uh, it could be uh, so info at infophysiotherapy.com. You can send me an email and I'll be happy to reply. Awesome. Hey, thank you very much. Really appreciate your time and appreciate you uh, being able to come on and have a chat with us. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was a, it was a blast. Well, ladies and gents, thanks again for listening in and we'll catch you next time. As always, wherever you're listening to this, we appreciate your time. And if you have any comments or suggestions, feel free to get in contact and let us know. Until next time.